Now I'm here to talk a little bit about crime prediction and Securitas, how we work with that, our journey through the last year for Securitas to be data driven in many senses, something they started recently. But first, who am I? So last time I was here in this room, I was defending my PhD, Supervised by Mass and Zoom. Um, but I've been with Deco for quite a few years. And um, I guess it was during my PhD I found out I was a data scientist. That was kind of like a term popping up around that time. But I think my interest and, and background is very data science, whatever that is. <laughs> I started um, a year ago in June. I started with um, Securitas as a senior data scientist uh, in Melbourne. And uh, I was like the first guy hired in. There was one other guy, but he was working with computer vision. So we were like the first two sitting there figuring out with some consultants in our own place, you know, what are we going to do? We started out, we, well, we're going to order a chair. To start. It was like that level. We were starting out quite new. So in this talk, I want to talk about like why did I choose Securitas and who are they? Um, the crime prediction we're doing and the challenges we face, some of our just few corporate sites on our first products, I'm not going to go into deep, it's just to share what we've been doing. Um, ethics and crime prediction, I was kind of, it's kind of a shame we missed the ethics talk, I was looking forward to that. But I'm going to talk a little bit about this. As you could imagine, this is, can be a controversial topic these days. Um, some of the data and algorithms, if we have time, not running over it too much, it's just a few slides, and, uh, and what we can do. All right, so starting with why did I pick Securitas, because I don't know, I forgot to say that, but my PhD was in medical image analysis. It's quite different from working for a garden company. But the thing is, walking around, doing a few interviews, I was looking for, so a lot of companies these days want to be data driven. So basically what they do is they start up a startup within themselves, make a little company, department and so on, hire a lot of people and say like, use our data. And I was looking for that opportunity because I wanted to be there at ground zero and when we're starting out to help build this. And considering the size of Securitas, it was quite impressive that they decided to do ground zero in Malmö. So that was a pretty, pretty cool opportunity. It's a Swedish company, but it's a global company. Um, also, when you start out like that, they have a lot of different ideas, so you can jump around a lot, saying now I'm going to do optimization, computer vision, prediction, and they have a lot of unique data. Um, to get into that, they started with this, they are like, we're a guarding company, then we integrate the solutions, you know, cameras, sensors, all that kind of stuff, and then, well, now we want to be, three years ago, they said we want to be the leader in data, or the lead in the security industry, as like the intelligent security company. So Securitas is the world's largest security company, at least in terms of employees. It's a huge company. Um, and in Sweden alone, there's 10,000 guards. So the data, they have, like the potential for data that they can generate if they utilize their guards and the historic legacy data that they have is pretty big. So I want to go into crime prediction. <laughs> What do you guys think when I say crime prediction? Minority report. <laughs> yeah? It's not even, it's not even far off. It's, I first had this prescience, you know, this cognition thing, looking into the future, or guessing at the future. Then I have this. And of course that's what I do, every day. No, it's not. But this is like, this is what people think of when they say crime prediction. I was trying to change the company's, you know, let's call it risk assessment, I just think crime prediction sounds more sexy, so I'll try and keep to that term, but I'll try and come into why, what can we actually do with it. But to be a bit more realistic, examples of related fields with crime prediction are more like this. It's about forecasting into the near and, and like for the future. So near future could be weather. You want to see like what's the what's going to happen in the next week. What's the what's the risk for a crime to actually happen? Retail, they do it a lot, but they do it with sales. They're like, how can we sell more? You know, what, when are we going to strike? But there's also time series predictions. And seismology is more based on like the historical perspective, but that's also what you do when you have data going back. Right? 
So there's a high dependency on time and space. It's affected by nearby events. And they're both historical, like long-term and present features. This is something they all kind of share. So crime prediction does not exist in a world of defensible morals. I mean, when we do not track or profile individuals, we can't say when crime will happen. Because that you can you can track a pro, you can track an individual and say like oh they're planning a crime, so you're predicting it's probably going to happen. But if you don't do that and we don't do that, we don't want to move into that entire gray zone, then it's not possible. However, we can do we can predict a forecast risk. We can predict when there's an increased chance of something to happen. Because this follows seasonal patterns. Here you can see actual data that we have observed a dynamic forecast. So we're kind of like trying to predict the risk following what we're actually seeing. There's also the whole broken window of crime begets crime kind of things, right? So for certain types of crime, when a crime happens, it increases the likelihood of crime happening in the neighborhood in the following days. That could be gang-related crime. It could be many things. So crime prediction or working with this kind of data is an immense challenge because there's a lot of problems. It's migratory, it can move around, crime waves, you might call it. There's also the public trust. What do you, how much do you trust when you, when you work with this, this kind of stuff? It's location specific, seasonal, highly dynamic, highly categorical. There's ethics and GDPR involved. And then there's this, as, which is more like relevant to a data scientist, I guess. Even for a huge company like Securitas, crime does not happen a lot. It's different than the US, I think. But, <laughs> In, in the rest of the world, it does not happen a lot. So we're into this issue of data dilution in time and space. Many of you know this ancient old precision versus accuracy problem. Uh, and this is highly evident here because we want to ask questions about time. We want to add features to our data set, right? We want to say summer versus winter, when does crime happen? Because it says more about, it gives a better like, understanding of it. And then we start asking, you know, day versus night, and every time you ask this kind of question, you do this over here. You get less and less data to work with. A bit of, a, like a big part of you as a data scientist wanting to predict crime is fitting the models. You use a bunch of features and your target data is the crime, right? So in this, you have, you have less than, you have 0.1% of actuals in training, like where crime has it. And that's if it was a single location. So in Sweden, we have around half a million call-outs, uh, call-out locations, sorry, that are being guarded, with 100,000 call-outs in 2018. About 6% of these were crime. So this means, even though we have, I mean, a lot of crime, technically, given, how, given the size of, of this, it's really, really little training. And that's not even when we differentiate crime categories. You know, now we're just calling it, we call it incidents a lot because, I don't know, it makes sense. We called it events, then we got confused when it was not crime. Now we call it incidents. Anyways, it's, you might have vandalism, you might have burglary, you might have robbery. These are probably affected different ways. And then you need models to take this into account. And usually you cannot just like have one fits all. So what happened a year ago in May 2018 was that we asked this question in security just around the time when I joined. It was a product owner and, and, and a consultant. They sat down and they plotted out the data. Here's some alarm. So all the blue spots here, they're all locations that has an alarm or somehow it's a the site. And the heat map is like over when the crime happened for the last four years or five years. Just the heat map of Malmö. Malmö has a lot of crime. I should say. We don't know the sustains, but when you're there, it's different. Um, so what happened from when I started was I joined this, like, okay, what can we do with this? It's just historical, aesthetic little data. Like, can we do, how far can we get with this? And then we started on this journey of, I called it a roadmap of temporal analytics. I think if you look, Google it, they'll call it business analytics a lot. But without knowing about these kind of like different stepping stones. This was kind of what happened anyways. You start with the data and you just investigate it as it is. Pure statistical stuff. 
Then you find descriptive features for it, you do some feature engineering, you try to fit, you do some regression, you do the clustering, whatever, you fit it to it. Then you, then you start doing more, a bit more advanced things with what we now call like static models, which is like models we fit, it's not just statistics, but we fit models back, to, back in time. So we're not saying anything about what's happening tomorrow. We're saying like generally, how does the model describe these areas? It's more like a region or location. And then you move into temporal features and it becomes more difficult. You want to say something about time, basically. And this is what this is, so this was the natural path, and then you start doing customer specific solutions, which is like, you know, customer comes out and say we want to know what's the risk at all our sites at any given time, and can you give us alerts and so on? Can we plan our guards of it? So it looks somewhat like this. And I'm uh, sorry, like the the last these there's a few corporate slides here, I didn't make this one. But um, right now, it's, I think it's looking like a mix of this, and you can click around, and you can kind of like figure out what's the, what's the impact right now, what's the risk, and so on. So again, like from you know, pure statistics to a static model to more real-time forecasting. Um, so one of the things we had to do when working with crime like this is, like that was a decision early on, was that we cannot really say it's dangerous going out and say does an incident happen or not. We have to kind of like, or, or just throwing a number out there, probability is not very descriptive either. So you start doing what you often see in this situation, you start putting a label on top of whatever like your probabilities are. So you say, well, this falls into these different categories, like how high is the risk? And then you can just say, based on how much risk happens in each category, what's the relative distance? And then we start using this and say, okay, so this at risk here stands for 83% of all the crime, but it's not very many of the actual areas that we're looking at. Because there's like, so urban areas usually account for a lot of this. Stockholm is just purely orange and red, basically. And Malmö too. Um, and then we start doing this, uh, then we start looking at how well are we doing. And we say, okay, well, we can, this, again, this should be mentioned, this is a recall thing, it's not precision. We use, what we often do here is to optimize, to have a single value to optimize over in the cost function, use like an F-beta score or something. So you make a decision, what's the importance between precision and recall. And in this kind of case, you're often more interested in recall. You're more interested in having a high risk when something happens than knowing when something shouldn't happen. But of course, you could just you could get 100% if you just said everything was fine. So that doesn't work either. You have to find a balance between these things. Um, and that was actually today in Stockholm. I just came directly from Stockholm, but they're actually releasing our first product for the customers, which is, of course, not very interesting to you, but for us, it's a big thing. It's about being able to forecast risk and do guarding on schedules and so on. But this has so many applications because you can start tracking people around the world and giving them alerts when they're in high risk areas and so on they don't know because it's a global company. There's like a lot of things you can do once you start building this and put it into different, you can have like your Apple Watch can warn you about anything. Um, and then, then getting a bit into the ethics in crime prediction um, is that it seems like a really good idea. I mean, you don't think of minority report. It seems, it seems, even that was a good concept, right? It's just, it's just a crime story, but still. So what could go wrong in this? <laughs> and, and it turns out that, you know, we're not the first ones trying to do this. There's actually a lot of things that can go wrong, especially when you ask the public and the media about this. So this is basically, the US were like ground zero, the first guys who come up with this, because they have so much data. They have a lot of crime. And to give an example, Predpol, one of the big ones, and so this stands for predictive policing. And they're also in a gray zone because they're like guiding police officers to kind of prevent crime. This is not something we do, for instance, Securitas, it's just a guarding company. I'm glad I'm not working with active enforcement and these kind of things. But they started in, at, with the, uh, I think it was the LAPD, yeah, that they, they were working with this guy who came up from uh, UCLA came up with like these earthquake algorithms. And that was very sexy because the media were like, oh, they're taking earthquake and using it to break crime. That's like amazing and easy to explain. 
<laughs> which was basically just what I think it says down here. So you treat the hotspots like where crime happens. A lot of fault lines, as you would do in seismology, and then when criminal activity happens, you know, you get a spike and then you can have after effects. So they're kind of like using those models. So what happened, but as you can see, like in an 18 by 18 kilometer area, there's like 5,300 situations. All they did here, they had so much crime in, in, in all, not even two years that they just, they didn't care about demographics. They didn't care about external features. They're just like, we just do like when police is called out and we try to like, just look crime. We don't even look at what sort of crime. And that of course landed in a world of problems because <laughs> They actually, they, they came in so many problems with media that this is an actual web page you can go to. <laughs> They're a company that does crime prediction and work with the police, and yet they have like this, they feel like they need to have this. And that's of course not a great thing, but you know, the media took it away and they were instantly like going out in this story and there was a lot of things that got them into problems, for instance, in. Uh, in these cities when there's a tendency to only call the police if you expect the police to show up. So you have areas where crime happens but there's no calls being made. And then you have areas where crime happens a lot of calls are being made. And that happened to be, for instance, like ghetto areas and these kind of things. In the US. So they were sending out police there and the police were walking around and it, it was kind of like a reinforcement, self-enforcing loop that, that got out of control. And I mean, they're still active today and they're still stressing like we're not doing anything with individuals and so on, but they're mostly active in the US because they can't really, Europe doesn't have enough crime. <laughs> so you have to start, that's what we're doing, you have to use external features, you just have to be careful with how you use them. So looking a bit at the data that we're using, is that, so we have that advantage of having all these scars and we own the data that we have and we're able to generate more. This is one of the strengths that we're working towards with the guards is being able to like ask them, you know, if they're in an area where we don't know anything, then we'll ask them, you know, what kind of area is this? Do you feel safe? Or, so we can start populating our data set for everywhere our guards are, 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 are traveling around. We can actually fill in the missing blanks and we can generate new data. That's the great thing about, so we're in Sweden mainly, but we're rolling out to Belgium and Norway, but it's a great thing about having 10,000 guards. And, uh, and target data server in crime prediction. So this is also something that of course is being guarded. But the features we're using to do crime prediction mostly at this time is like open street map of information, easy to come by, it's demographics from the public sector, like we bought them from the public in Sweden, weather forecasts, um, real time populations, density data, foot tra traffic, that kind of stuff, guard reports and so on. And what we want to do is there's like a lot of things that we can find the time for. There's so, there's so many interesting things, so features you can try and like, when you talk about risk, could be a demonstration, football match between two competing that don't like each other, you know, that kind of stuff. Also the whole concept of subjective feeling, that's not data that's easy to come by, but this is also something you can start harvesting, right? And the way we're working right now is that we're using HC Boost, um, which for those who work with decision trees and that kind of stuff is a version after Random Forest and other boost. So it's a community to develop things, very efficient, it scales well, it's fast and so on. And fast is really important because when you do a time series, you have to retrain the model all the time. You can't just build on top of it because if you want to forecast into the near future, you can't use a model as a month old. And it handles missing value as well. It, it's, um, <coughs> it wins a lot of Kaggle competitions and that kind of stuff because it's an ensemble model. It kind of uses a lot of different weak learners to adapt and kind of overfit to data sets. Which is great for something like uh, crime prediction because we don't have the luxury of doing, it's hard to do cross-validation because you have to like compare the same kind of month, the same kind of seasonality and so on. So splitting train and test data is difficult. And you also, so, so what you typically do is you just cut out like three months or so 
from the near future, and then you go back in time, you train your model, and then you just step through it like as if it was real time, and see how good you're doing. Um, there's also other things I wanted to mention. We looked at this, but it doesn't. It did as well. This is the, like probably the most common thing to use for these time series analysis, which is it takes two common things: moving average and also regressive. Then it uh, then it then comes the integrator, so it becomes what's known as an ARIMA model. And then if you want to start using seasonal patterns, you can add this being added in here, and then external variables. That's everything that's not time related. Static features, something that doesn't change. Like, say you have a snapshot of demographics, you know, that doesn't change from week to week. However, we found that XGBoost handles it just as well. It actually captures the seasonal effect, even though it's not at this, it, it's not really a part of the model itself or how it works, but it does seem to catch it. So, recommendable if you want to play around with this. So, there's a lot of things going on with what we're working on. There's like. There's so many things. I just wanted to include this here because it's, um, we're also looking for, of course I'm going to say we're recruiting people. This is one of the reasons I'm here. But, uh, and also because it's awesome to be invited and be able to speak here. Um, but it's been a cool journey going from medical image analysis and like working a year in, in predictive analysis and crime prediction and these kind of things and building products out of like from zero to nothing, and like we had the first launch half a year after I started. Um, and now it's just a lack of people really, because securities, they don't want to do, they, just, they don't only want to do crime prediction, they want to do guard airport optimization. How do you get people through an airport in a good way so you don't open too many security checks, but you predict when you want to open them based on, and they're already doing that and quite successful with it. Then you maybe you want to optimize when the guards are, how they move around. They, they're close, you can combine it with, with the risk assessment, say like we want them close to where something might happen. And you and of course false alarms is a big when you have like half a million callouts a year, there's a lot of false alarms. I mean crime, actual like not false alarms is less than one percent of the calls. So that's also an easy way to that's also not easy but something one thing. All right. And that is, uh, that's all I have. You have to remember the users of something like this is the guys planning the security for the different sites and like how the guiding schedules are and so on. And they'd like this kind of information. So it's it's not it might not be something where they're like we're gonna act on it directly unless it's like these event alerts or something directly, but it's mostly like they wanna be able to see what what why are these areas higher risk than the others, what can we do about it? You know, and when does this typically happen? Usually, in, in reality, you can never beat like localized knowledge in the guards because they'll know like, well, this is around. Usually, it's around with retail. It's around opening and closing that stuff happened. You know, so the guards will be there, and there's like a lot of things. But we, what we can do is kind of advise them, and what we can say is, I think one of the really important things is here. Maybe as a customer, you want to know what's happening around you, because we have like a lot of other customers around here. Of course, we're not going to share what, like. Oh, this guy next to you forgot to lock his window for last week. But there is like you can say burglary happened nearby or whatnot, and that kind of stuff. I don't know if it answers it. I think it's a very it's something we work with with the customers to figure out what do they actually want. Because we start out saying, okay, we can do this. Now we have to figure out what works for you. And there's also construction sites are different from shopping malls and so on. Like construction sites might have, they have a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of stuff being stolen from construction sites. Yeah? That's so why it was a related question because we, when you do this, you need to consider the information to what you do, how you act on knowledge. Uh, so you cannot simply say you provide the knowledge, uh, so we need to, uh, and, and, and also at the airports, we need to be able to give an explanation when you do send people out. Uh, so, so. And that's interesting because as a lot of Still on going out to explain these uh, HTDUs, uh, right? Yeah. Explain it to a data scientist. 
actually, I forgot to say this, that's actually why I had these three points. So, like the, the bottom one here, I think kind of addresses that. I mean, you talk about prediction, but you have to realize that no one else knows, like data scientists knows what you mean, but the public, they, they see something else when you say this, right? And then there's also what's been a common topic so far, is like autonomous decision makers. Never, never let, I mean, of course, for some instances it might be like that, but most of the time it's not. Most of the times you're giving labels and warnings. So talking about algorithms taking decisions on their own is just it's not a good thing. Last question. Uh, how do you pre prevent the workers from picking the green arrows? But this this kind of goes back to the whole concept of we're not doing we're not actually predicting crime. We have, we're predicting risk, and of course areas will change. They do from day to day, and of course I don't know how public this tool will be in that sense. <laughs> I mean, we're not going to share exactly what we built for the customers with the guys who can break in there. Like that's a big thing. Security is doing military contracts. They can't just share like the data. Like they have information like what kind of roads are being used for uh, landing fields in case of wartime and so on. There's a lot of like really sensitive information that we don't touch. Can we continue uh, the question yeah. and answers yeah. at the menu? Because uh, the food is ready down in the south end. So thank you very much.